Welcome to the deep dive. Uh, we're your fast track to getting informed. Yeah, really informed, really fast. Today, we're um, jumping into something amazing, your own body. It really is the most complex machine, isn't it? Fascinating stuff. Totally. So we're boiling down chapter one of Human Anatomy and Physiology, the 10th edition. Giving you that shortcut, that foundational understanding. So it's all put together. And crucially, how it works. Because understanding that is key. Absolutely. You know, why does this matter? Well, it's vital. Whether you're trying to understand, like, medical news or make health choices. No. Maybe even thinking about a health career. Right. These basics are the bedrock. Exactly. They help you appreciate how incredibly resilient your body is. So we'll be looking at uh, how structure dictates function. The organization. From tiny atoms right up to you. What you need to survive. How you maintain balance. Homeostasis, yeah. And the specific language we use to talk about it all accurately. Okay, let's dive in. First up, this fundamental link between anatomy and physiology. Right. So anatomy is the what? The structures. Things you can see and touch, basically mm -hmm. bones, muscles, organs. Exactly. Concrete stuff. And physiology is the how. How those parts work. The function. Yeah, how they carry out all the life-sustaining activities. And the key thing is, you can't really get the how without understanding the what. The function depends on the structure. Precisely. It's called the principle of complementarity of structure and function. There are two sides of the same coin. Okay, give us an example. Well, think about bones. They're hard, yeah. right? Because they contain minerals. So they can support and protect. Exactly. Their structure allows that function. Oh. Or uh, the heart valves. Oh, yeah, they only open one way. Right. Their shape, their structure ensures blood flows in one direction. Form dictates function. Makes sense. So how do we study anatomy? Ah, Lots of ways. There's gross anatomy, the big stuff you can see with your naked eye, yeah. your heart, your lungs. Within that, you might study regionally, like looking at everything in the leg, mm -hmm. or systemically studying one system, like the cardiovascular system, heart and vessels. What else? Then there's surface anatomy, relating internal structures to the skin surface, like feeling for a pulse. Right. And then smaller stuff. Yep. Microscopic anatomy, things too small for the naked eye. That includes cytology the study of cells, the basic units of life, and histology, the study of tissues, groups of cells working together. Interesting. Any other types? Oh, sure. Developmental anatomy tracks changes through life, including embryology before birth and specialized branches like um, pathological anatomy, looking at disease changes or radiographic anatomy using x-rays and scans. Oh, and what about physiology? How is that broken down? Physiology often focuses on specific organ systems. So you have renal physiology for kidneys, neurophysiology for the nervous system. Cardiovascular physiology for the heart and blood vessels. Got it. Exactly. But mm -hmm. physiology often goes deeper, right down to the cellular and molecular levels. So looking at the chemistry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Chemical reactions, electrical currents, physics principles. Think about nerve impulses, muscle contractions, blood pressure. It's all mechanisms. And you need tools for anatomy too, right? Not just looking. Oh, yeah. Observation, sure, but also manipulation, feeling organs, the, the palpation, and listening to sounds, which is auscultation, plus that precise terminology we mentioned. Okay, so from parts and functions, let's talk organization. How is the body built up? It's this amazing hierarchy. Starts super small at the chemical level. Atoms combine into molecules like water or proteins. The basic building blocks. Then those molecules form organelles, which make up cells the smallest units of actual life. That's the cellular level. And cells group together. Yep, similar cells with a common function form a tissue. That's the tissue level. There are four basic types. Oh, I remember this. Epithelium. Right. Covers surfaces, lines, cavities, yeah. then muscle for movement. Connective tissue for support. Support protection, yeah. And nervous tissue for quick communication using electrical signals. Okay, four tissue types, then what? Tissues combine to form an organ. Like yeah. the stomach it needs epithelium, muscle, connective tissue, nerve fibers, all working together for digestion. That's the organ level. And organs work together, too. In organ systems. Groups of organs cooperate for a common purpose. That's the organ system level. Right. And there are 11 of those major systems. Should we uh, quickly run through them? Yeah, let's do a quick overview. You've got the integumentary system. Skin, hair, nails, protection, vitamin D, synthesis. Skeletal system. Bones, joints, support, protection, movement framework, making blood cells. Muscular system. Skeletal muscles, mainly. Movement, posture, heat generation. Nervous system. Brain, spinal cord, nerves, fast-acting control, response to stimuli. Endocrine system, gland-secreting hormones, think growth, metabolism, reproduction. Cardiovascular system, heart, blood vessels, 
transporting blood, oxygen, nutrients, waste. Crucial. Lymphatic system immunity. Lymph nodes, spleen, etc. Returns leaked fluid, fights infection. Respiratory system. Lungs, airways. Brings in oxygen, gets rid of carbon dioxide. Digestive system. Stomach, intestines, liver. Breaks down food, absorbs nutrients. Urinary system. Car Kidneys, bladder. Eliminates waste, regulates water and electrolytes. And finally, the reproductive systems, male and female, for producing offspring. Who? That's all 11. And all these systems working together make up the highest level. The organismal level, the whole living human being. Yeah, exactly. And it highlights how interdependent everything is. All your cells, all your systems, they rely on each other constantly. Okay, so that's how we're built. What does the body actually do to stay alive. Ah, the necessary life functions. These are the fundamental jobs every complex organism performs, like maintaining boundaries. Keeping the inside in and the outside out, like skin. And cell membranes too, on a smaller scale. Then there's movement, not just walking, but internal movement too. Like blood flow or food moving through your gut. Precisely. Also responsiveness or excitability, mm -hmm. sensing changes and reacting. That withdrawal reflex, like touching something hot. That's a classic example. The nervous system is key there. Then digestion, breaking down food. To get nutrients you can absorb. Yep. And metabolism, which is really all the chemical reactions in your body, building things up, breaking things down, making energy, ATP. That involves a lot of systems working together, right? Digestive, respiratory, cardiovascular. Endocrine too, absolutely. Yeah. Then excretion, getting rid of waste products. Poop, pee, carbon dioxide. Exactly. Reproduction is vital too, both cellular for growth and repair and organismal for the species. And finally, growth, getting bigger either by more cells or bigger cells. Those are the functions. Now to do those functions, the body needs certain things from the environment. Right, the survival needs. These are things you have to get. Correct. First, nutrients, food, for energy and building blocks, carbs, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals. Essential, what else? Oxygen, can't live without it needed for those energy-releasing reactions. Respiratory and cardiovascular systems deliver it. Water makes up more than half your body weight. Yep. Provides the environment for reactions, acts as a base for fluids, then normal body temperature. Around 37 Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. Why is that so critical? Because metabolic reactions are super sensitive to temperature changes. Too hot or too cold, and they slow down or stop. Muscles help generate heat. Okay, one more. Appropriate atmospheric pressure. You need the right pressure for breathing and getting gases exchanged properly in your lungs. And the key is having these in the right amounts. Not too much, not too little. That is the crucial point. Balance. Which okay. leads us perfectly into... And homeostasis. The big one. It really is. The body's ability to maintain stable internal conditions, even when everything outside is changing. It's not static, though, is it? It's dynamic. Exactly. A dynamic state of equilibrium. Yeah. Always adjusting, keeping things within a narrow, healthy range. So how does a body do that? What's the mechanism? Well, all homeostatic controls have three parts. Think of figure 1.4 in the book. First, the receptor. The sensor. It detects change, a stimulus. Right. It monitors the environment and sends input along a pathway to the second part. The control center, usually the brain or spinal cord. Often, yeah. It figures out the set point, the level things should be at. It analyzes the input and determines the right response. And sends output instructions to that. The effector. Mm. The third part, this carries out the response. It could be a muscle, a gland, whatever makes the change happen. Okay, receptor, control center, effector, simple enough. And most of the time, these systems work by negative feedback. Meaning the response reduces or shuts off the original stimulus. Precisely. The variable changes in the opposite direction of the initial change, bringing it back towards the set point, the ideal value. Like the thermostat in your house. Temperature drops, furnace kicks on, temperature rises, furnace shuts off. Perfect analogy. Your body does this constantly for temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, blood sugar levels using insulin. It's the main way we maintain stability. But there's another type, positive yeah. feedback. Yeah, much less common. Here, the response actually enhances or exaggerates the original stimulus. The change proceeds in the same direction. So it pushes things further away from the starting point. Sounds dangerous. It can be, but it's usually for controlling infrequent events that need to happen quickly and go to completion. They're often called cascades. Like what? Childbirth is the classic example. Oxytocin release intensifies contractions, which causes more oxytocin release, leading to even stronger contractions. Until the baby's born, then it stops. Exactly. 
Blood clotting is another one. Platelets stick to a wound, release chemicals, attract more platelets, building a clot rapidly. So positive feedback has its place. But what happens when homeostasis fails? That's when we get homeostatic imbalance. Yeah. Essentially, that's what disease is. The body's internal environment is no longer stable. And this happens more as we age? Generally, yes. Our control systems become less efficient, increasing the risk of illness. Sometimes negative feedback can even get overwhelmed and turn into destructive positive feedback loops, like in some types of heart failure. It really highlights how vital that balance is. Okay, to talk about all this precisely, we need a common language. Absolutely critical. Anatomical terminology prevents confusion. Everyone uses the same reference points and terms. Starting with the anatomical position, right? The standard reference. Body standing erect, feet slightly apart, palms facing forward, thumbs pointing out, away from the body. And right and left always refer to the person being viewed, not the viewer. Correct. From that position, we use directional terms, like superior towards the head, inferior towards the feet. Anterior or ventral for the front, posterior or dorsal for the back. Medial towards the midline, lateral away from it. Intermediate between medial and lateral. And for limbs, proximal means closer to the point of attachment or trunk. And distal means farther away. Also superficial for towards the surface and deep for more internal. Got it. Then there are regional terms for specific body areas. Yes, the body is divided into the axial part, head, neck, and trunk, and the appendicular part, the limbs or appendages. So you hear terms like cervical for neck, thoracic for chest, brachial for arm, femoral for thigh. Exactly. Figure 1.7 shows a lot of these. They let us be very specific about location. And when we want to look inside, we use imaginary cuts or planes. Body planes and sections, yeah. They lie at right angles to each other. A sagittal plane divides the body vertically into right and left parts. If it's right down the middle, it's mid-sagittal or median. Correct. Off-midline sagittal cuts are parasagittal. Then a frontal or coronal plane divides the body vertically into anterior and posterior parts front and back. And the transverse or horizontal plane runs horizontally, dividing into superior and inferior parts, like a cross section. Right. You can also have oblique sections cut diagonally, but they're less common. And these planes are super important for understanding medical images. Absolutely. They connect directly to medical imaging. Basic x-rays show dense stuff like bones well. But computed tomography, CT scans, use x-rays to create detailed cross-sectional images, really useful for the brain or abdomen. What about MRI? Magnetic resonance imaging uses magnetic fields and radio waves to map hydrogen atoms, gives amazing high contrast images of soft tissues, great for brain scans, finding tumors, looking at joints. And ultrasound. Sonography. Uses sound waves. It's safe, inexpensive, good for things like checking fetal development. Doesn't penetrate bone or air well, though. Are there others? Sure. PT scans, hmm. positron emission tomography, look at metabolic activity, showing which tissues are most active. Good for brain function studies. Mm. And things like DSA, digital subtraction, and geography, specifically look at blood vessels. So these technologies let us see inside non-invasively. Pretty incredible. It is. Though remember, the images are often computer-generated reconstructions, sometimes enhanced. Okay, last major topic, body cavities. Where are all the organs housed? They're mostly within closed body cavities, lined by membranes. Mm. Two main set, the dorsal body cavity is towards the back. Protecting the nervous system. Right. It includes the cranial cavity for the brain and the vertebral or spinal cavity for the spinal cord. They're continuous. And the other set? The ventral body cavity, more anterior, larger. Houses the internal organs, the viscera. This one's divided. Yes, by the diaphragm. Yeah. Above it is the thoracic cavity, the chest. It contains the lungs, each in its own pleural cavity. And the heart? The heart sits in the central part the mediastinum, within its own pericardial cavity. The mediastinum also holds the esophagus and trachea. Okay, below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity. Right, no physical separation inside, but we distinguish the superior abdominal cavity, stomach, liver, intestines, spleen. From the inferior pelvic cavity, bladder, some reproductive organs, rectum. And clinically, it's worth noting the abdominal organs are a bit more vulnerable to injury because they're mainly protected by muscle, while the pelvic organs have more bony protection. Now, you mentioned membranes lining these cavities. Yes. In the ventral cavity, we have serious membranes, or serosa, thin, double-layered membranes. Double-layered? How does that work? Think of pushing your fist into a balloon. The layer clinging to your fist, the organ, is the visceral serosa. The outer wall of the balloon lining the cavity is the parietal serosa. Oh, okay. And the space between? Contains a thin layer of lubricating serous fluid. 
It reduces friction as organs move, like your heart beating or lungs expanding. And these membranes have specific names. Yep, based on location. Around the heart, it's the pericardium, visceral and parietal. Around the lungs, the pleurae and lining the abdominal pelvic cavity and covering its organs, the peritoneum. And inflammation here is bad. Yeah, pleurisy or peritonitis. The surfaces get rough, stick together, causing pain. Okay, and that abdominal pelvic cavity is huge. How do we describe locations within it? Two main ways. Medical staff often use four quadrants, right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower, divided by lines to the umbilicus navel. Simple enough. Anatomists often prefer a more detailed grid of nine regions, like a tic-tac-toe board. It includes regions like the umbilical region, middle, epigastric, above that, hypogastric, below, and then paired regions like the lumbar, iliac inguinal, and hypochondriac regions on the sides. More precise for locating specific organs. Exactly. Figure 1.12 shows which organs are typically found in which region. Are there any other cavities? A few smaller ones, mostly in the head and open to the outside. Oral and digestive cavities, the nasal cavity, orbital cavities for the eyes, middle ear cavities, and synovial cavities within joints. Wow. Okay, that covers a lot of ground for Chapter 1. It really does lay the groundwork for everything else. Understanding the terms, the organization, homeostasis, it's essential. So wrapping up this deep dive, we've journeyed from the basic partnership of anatomy and physiology, form and function. Through the incredible levels of organization, the essential needs for survival. The crucial concept of homeostasis and how it's maintained, mostly by negative feedback. And finally, the precise language and mapping the terms, planes, and cavities we use to navigate the human body. It really is an intricate and dynamic design. Absolutely. And appreciating these fundamentals really empowers you, you yeah. know, to understand health news, your own body, maybe even inspire further study. That constant self-regulation is just remarkable. Couldn't agree more. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for listening. We truly appreciate you being part of our last minute lecture family.